The Directory owed a great debt to General Napoleon Bonaparte. The Firmadorian moderates that overthrew the infamous Robespierre's Jacobin reign of terror would have seen their new government killed in its infancy, if it wasn't for General Vendemiaire and his whiff of grape shot in 1795. They would not have had the valuable legitimation and distraction if the same general hadn't won his quick string of victories in northern Italy, and they wouldn't be even the least bit close to peace if Napoleon had not offered it to the Habsburg Emperor 150 kilometers from Vienna. But all along, Bonaparte was being a sly weasel. The only reason he was fortunate enough to be in Paris on that night in 1795 was because he was ignoring his orders to go fight the civil war in the Vendée against the counter-revolutionary royalists. During the Italian campaign, counter to directorial instruction, on his own initiative, he created sister republics on this side of the Alps. He refused to march into Rome and humiliate the Pope, and now he refused to allow the directory's envoys to handle the peace negotiations with the Habsburg monarchy. Now, it's true he managed all that because the squabbling directors didn't do much to stop him. Let's backtrack a little. The directorial government was formed by all those that turned against Robespierre and the Jacobins on the 9th of Fermidor of the year 2 of the revolutionary calendar. That is to say, the 27th of July, 1794. In 1795, they created a new constitution that was supposed to curb political power and extend the decision and lawmaking process, countering the previous radical, manipulative and too fast-acting regime. The ideal was to have five executive directors governing France to the will of the new bicameral legislature. The lower house, the Council of 500, would propose laws, while the upper house, the Council of the Ancients, would only have the power to approve or disprove, and one-third of members of both houses would face elections every year. Think a bit like the US Senate, but uh, a lot shorter terms. They would be elected by 30,000 voters who passed the tax census. The ideal of checks and balances did not work out. After curbing some of the more extreme measures of the previous regime, the directory fell into a state of comfort, or discomfort if you prefer. The legislature took too long to make decisions, the directors squabbled and conspired amongst themselves, and the directory became a synonym for a corrupt regime of luxury and patronage. But, like almost all French regimes of this period, it lived in constant fear of a large threat of conspiracy. The revolutionary fear of royalist conspiracies was a given. While the fear of a neo Jacobin conspiracy returning France to the terror with aims of radical egalitarianism persisted in the minds of the new bourgeois Firmadorians, they created the election system to avoid a Jacobin resurgence. Since most Jacobin support came from the lower classes of the big cities, excluding them from voting via the high tax census and moving a lot of the voting power outside of the cities, it was assumed that they would be kept in a continual minority. But the Firmadorians also lived in the continued fear that many amongst themselves would turn at any moment to an opposing side. Considering that most of them did that in 1794, the fear was probably not irrational. But the first big shock came in April of 1797, when the elections to the Council of 500 had taken place. The returned results saw an ousting of a large number of Firmadorian members of the body. Suspecting that most of the new members were royalists and feeling an increase in royalist agitation, supported by the suspicion that the body had elected a long-suspected royalist, General Pichegru, as its president, three of the five directors decided to prepare a preemptive coup despite the opposition of the other two. On the 4th of September, 18th of Fructidor, by the revolutionary calendar, directors Paul Barat, Louis-Marie de Revelier, and Jean-François Revel put their plans in motion. Troops under General Lazare Hoche and Pierre Augereau arrested politicians and closed down newspapers under accusations of being royalists. Even if they were Jacobins, they would still accuse them of being royalists. 
since Jacobins were still technically revolutionary, so being one was technically not illegal. Among those accused and persecuted for royalism were the two opposing directors, François-Marie Barthélemy and Lazare Carnot, who was a former Jacobin and a former member of Robespierre's Committee of Public Safety. This all happened while Napoleon was negotiating the Treaty of Campo Formio with the Habsburg monarchy, which was signed on the 18th of October, 1797, after which Napoleon came back to Paris in triumph having brought victory and peace to France on land. You can imagine the partial relief that was felt by the directors and others in Paris when Napoleon suggested to leave for Egypt and capture it to threaten British trade to the Far East. If he won, good. Maybe he will stay there. If he lost, well, let's just say that nobody would really mind if he turned out to be a Pompey and not a Caesar.